Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Green Tech Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Green Tech Today, the Twit Network's Top 25 Innovators Series. This episode of Green Tech Today is brought to you by the Eco Imagination Challenge from GE. GE and its partners are awarding $200 million to ideas that help build the next generation power grid for the 21st century. For more information and to view and comment on ideas, go to ecomagination.com forward slash challenge. And by squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to publish a high quality website or blog. For a free trial and 10% off the lifetime of your new account, go to squarespace.com and use the offer code GTT. The Danish are known for their windmills, but they aren't the only ones who are harnessing the power of the wind. Here in the U.S., Makani Power is looking at the traditional source of renewable power from an entirely different perspective, turning the windmill into the wing of a plane. What better way to access the stronger, more consistent winds that blow at high altitudes than to actually take to the skies? Airplanes in the sky to create power for your home. That's a new idea here at Makani Power. This is Corwin Hardham, and he is the CEO of Makani Power. Corwin, can you tell me what was the inspiration behind using lofted planes to generate energy? Uh, well, the first inspiration, I think, actually really came from kite surfing. So kite surfing, you feel a tremendous amount of force from this very, very lightweight wing. So you have a kite up in the sky and it's pulling you along across the water. And it's a fairly almost obvious conclusion to come to that there's a lot of uh, energy available here and you're not using very much material to actually generate that amount of force, that amount of energy. And uh, so you start to think about that for a little while and then you start to think that maybe this is worth doing a little bit more analysis on. So was, were you out kite surfing and just thinking about the energy that was being used in the process? Was this in, uh, employing part of your your background, well, your your scientific background, while you're out there on the water. Uh, it's something. <laughs> it's hard to, as you know, it's hard to turn off the scientific mind at any point. So yeah, being on the water, you think about all sorts of things, and one of them is uh, precisely that: just how much uh, energy would be available, how much power you could generate with something like this. What are your estimates? What do you think can be generated? Well, one of the things that's really interesting about kites, in particular, is there no theoretical limit. So you could, as far as single system size, you could make very, very large wings. In fact, you could do 100 megawatt or maybe even gigawatt system scales, which um, for wind turbines is completely out of the realm of possibility. Um, and we're not aiming to do anything that large as in the next couple of years, but it is an interesting thought experiment. Yeah, how, how does this, um, your, your thought experiment, the concept right now, how do you expect it to compare against uh, the common wind turbine? Yeah, so compared to conventional wind, the simple performance metrics that we look at are capacity factor, and that's basically how much energy you're able to generate for a certain size of system. And Makani, the kite airborne wind technology they're working on, is capable of doubling the capacity factor, so twice the amount of energy for the same scale of system. And we do that with only about 20% of the mass. So twice as much energy, 20% of the mass is a pretty exciting proposal. Yeah. And that's, that's what we think is the most compelling aspect of this. And what are, what are the basics behind how the concept works? Uh, so the basics are, you can think about it in a couple of different ways. One of them mm -hmm. works quite well is you think about a conventional wind turbine, like a three-bladed wind turbine you mm -hmm. see on the side of the road. or. Uh, and as these blades are going around in a circle, and if you can imagine just taking one of those blades off, so imagine the blade flying off, tying a string to that blade to the ground, and now this single blade or wing is actually flying around in circles. So it's, it's flying around just like the tip of a wind turbine, mm -hmm. the very same path, um, but instead of having this large tower and all of the supporting structure, you just have the effective part, just the blade. And okay. it's up a little higher in the sky, so it gets better wind resource, 
But the most important thing is that that wing is flying at the same speed as what the tip used to be operating at on a wind turbine. So the most effective part of the wind turbine is now used and only the most effective part. That sounds like a really neat idea. We've got a, a model of one of, do you call them kites or planes? They look a lot like, uh, we, like planes. They look a lot more like wings. Yeah, yeah, they do. They're rigid and they have all of the same attributes as an airplane wing in that they have flaps, they have rotors, all of these things. We, we do call them wings. Technically, they are kites in that you have an airfoil that's tethered to the ground. What implementation. Implementation <laughs> of these. Where are some of the best places that you, you say that, that you think this can be implemented? You said that um, there are a number of more locations because mm -hmm. it can, it, the wind speeds, required wind speeds are reduced. How about, you know, what are the, what are the places that are most optimal? Right, yeah, so the, uh, just in terms of numbers, we're, we offer about a five-fold increase in the amount of land in the continental U.S. of what we believe to be economically viable for this technology by comparison to conventional wind. And that's just based on resource. But as far as the best possible places to put this technology, Offshore is by far the best place. Why and is that? The reason being is that we are, so if you have a wind turbine, you're putting this, I'm going to, this will be my hand as the wind turbine, mm -hmm. right, catching the wind. And you put this offshore, you've got this fairly severe cantilever structure, mm -hmm. which has a very large overturning moment. Mm -hmm. So the wind blows here, it wants to tip the thing over, you have to have a lot of structure underneath the water in order to hold this thing up. Right. And that's particularly difficult offshore off the California coast where it's quite deep. Yeah, especially you go off the continental shelf and it's quite a, quite a problem. Yes, quite a <laughs> precipitous uh, drop off, right. Yeah. But, um, so it's quite difficult and quite expensive to actually build these large floating turbines offshore. Whereas, and primarily because you do have to have this very large keel basically to keep the thing upright. And so kind of how far offshore they can go is limited by that. Well, the new floating ones can go very far offshore because they tolerate very deep waters. Mm -hmm. But the neat thing about the Makani system is you've got this wing flying around now, and it's got a tether coming down to the ocean. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't really mind if the buoy that's on the ocean surface tilts around. So the line can go directly down to an anchor, whether it be like a suction anchor or something like that, or a piled anchor, mm -hmm. um, on the ocean floor, and then express that, that tension, that aerodynamic force, directly into that anchor. So the structure we actually need on the, the ocean surface is, is minimal. And that's really exciting because you start to have a technology which is renewable and offshore the resource is absolutely tremendous. There's tons of wind out there. And you have a system which then can operate in deep waters in this great resource. Nobody has to look at it if it's far enough offshore. And nobody hears it. There's no birds. None of the environmental concerns is very consistent, relatively inexpensive form of renewable energy that could just be piped to shore. So that, I think, is very exciting. Yeah, that's really exciting. And the um, reliability of these, how are you trying to basically ensure their reliability? Well, the, uh, you know, the commercial aviation has done a, a good job, as has the wind turbine industry, industry in, in making very reliable equipment. And so there is a lot of uh, prior art, you could say, to doing things like this. At the same time, it's very easy to argue things like, you know, commercial airplanes get maintained all the time and so forth. The things that we have to offer to enable um, high reliability is, is a couple things. We, for example, don't have any gearbox in our systems. Mm -hmm. um, they're all direct drive. And by virtue of that, we can get down to a system which has no mechanical, uh, you know, surface on surface um, components. And there's a number of different things that we do like that. There's also things that we do in terms of redundancy. But even in um, fairly uh, bad cases where you do have system failure, we do have triple redundant avionics packages. So we actually have, you can think about those are the brains that are flying the kite. You have three different computer systems which are always looking at all times to make sure that all the components are working as they should be. And then even if we lose part of the system, we can actually still land the kite autonomously and then maintain it. How high are you planning to fly these? Is, right, there, right. is there a range that's the, the most efficient altitude? Uh, that's or? a good question. There's a lot of things to say about this. The, the altitude we fly at is between 200 and 400 meters. Okay. So we're around 1,000 feet, for those of you who like to work in English units. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, yeah, so 200 to 400 meters. And that would be for a megawatt scale device. But that's about where we would fly for most scales between um, slightly larger than this wing, which is quite small. and a very, very large wing, which is maybe one or two or more megawatts in system scale. 
So flying 200 to 400 meters, you're not really getting into, are you getting into FAA territory with airplanes? We are, or? well, everything that's flying is in, to some degree uh, yeah. in, of concern to the FAA. We are below 2,000 feet, which is where the FAA draws a line as far as uh, an airspace where they are very tightly controlled, where it is tightly controlled. So you, but you still, is there going to uh, be some accounting factor for the objects in the sky to make sure there aren't any kind of air accidents? Um, yeah, certainly we will be, uh, we have to, um, when you set up a wind farm, it's the mm -hmm. same thing actually, if you set up wind turbines, you have to designate where that site's going to be. Mm -hmm. And in order to be insured, you have to be able to be certified from the FAA that you are occupying this zone of space. And the same thing for our systems, since our systems are tied in one place to the ground, they're not moving around in a broad sense, they're located to this one you can almost think about like this uh, hemisphere of space where the, the tethered object can fly around inside. And so within that area, that is a controlled mm -hmm. or an airspace which is taken up by our system. But it is relatively low, so it doesn't really disrupt, it certainly doesn't disrupt commercial aviation. It disrupts private aviation to some extent, but it's on the same level as like a tall building or a radio tower. What are your estimates for environmental impacts? The Altamont Pass is a well-known flyway. There are many bird deaths as a result of its placement. Is there, you know, there's definitely going to be considerations of that kind, but what, what other kinds of impacts environmentally are there? Yeah, well, the, the first thing to say is that with regard to birds, and, uh, you know, we can talk about a number of different things. There's birds, there's uh, view shed, as people talk about it. So in other words, obstructing people's views and so forth. But many of these different environmental concerns, uh, concerns individuals might have about the landscape, mm -hmm. a lot of that it does have to do with sighting. So in other words, where you actually put this thing? Are you putting it into, as you said, into a major migratory path of birds? And so one of the nice things that's neat about what this technology does is it works in a lot less wind. Mm -hmm. So in other words, you don't need as good a sight as you did for conventional wind because it's able to have this much higher capacity factor. Yeah. And so by virtue of that, we're able to actually sight it in many more places. So whereas before you had to sort of on a larger macroscopic level, you had to pick out a very good wind site, and then on a sort of much more local um, condition, you had to site basically on the local high spots. With this technology, you can site much more broadly in general, and then specifically, uh, the wing doesn't really mind if it's sighted down in a sort of a, a dip or a low spot, because it actually can fly out of the low spot. And so you have much more flexibility about staying out of the way of birds and also staying out of the way of what people might want to look at. And you're also much higher than most of the birds of prey. Very cool. What are some of the challenges facing you as you're uh, developing this innovative idea? Uh, well, there's a number of challenges. It is, uh, it's a neat technology and there are a lot of interesting technical problems to be solved. Mm -hmm. There are certainly regulatory aspects that you've already touched on as far as with the FAA and so forth. Uh, as far as the technology goes, we've uh, been quite successful at demonstrating many of the controls problems and many of the different parts of the technology that need to be shown. And, and we have been able to show that this is actually quite feasible and actually meets the performance metrics that we've set forth in all of our modeling and simulation. But the main things that remain to be done is actually to make a bigger version of what stands behind us. So uh, for reference, a megawatt system will have about a 100 foot span and it'd be a relatively large wing. Yeah. And then we need to prove that it'll be very reliable. So large scale and very high reliability is what this company is now focused on. We've now demonstrated the performance. We need to demonstrate that we can do it at a very large scale and then also remain operational for years on end. Yeah, one of the benefits uh, that has been stated about these is that they are uh, must, much less resource intensive in terms of constructing the wing and getting them right. lofted than, mm -hmm. say, a wind turbine. What are uh, the estimated costs once you get this to a production level? How much do you estimate something like this would cost to implement and how long do you, are you into the future are we looking for implementation? How far away is this? Uh, so we're about two, two years away from launching our larger prototype and about five years away from commercialization. Well. So it's relatively short considering what needs to happen or actually considering I'd say what the, uh, the fact and, the, and the, uh, the prize at the end of the day is. As far as costs go, there's several different parts of the cost, but the most important thing at the end of the day is cost of energy generated. Right? So the cost of energy we expect to be about 40% cheaper than conventional wind. And that 
in general puts you about at the same level as coal-fired power. So that, I think, is the, so the lowest of the low as far as a benchmark goes. Yep. And so to be predicting cost competitiveness, I would say in a relatively conservative scenario that we've laid out, mm -hmm. um, is a pretty exciting thing. And then the other part you were touching on as far as the scalability of the technology in terms of resource allocation and consumption, yeah. that is a really, really exciting part of this. So for reference, uh, conventional wind turbine uses about 100 tons per megawatt, and that's tower, blades, nacelle, generator, mm -hmm. all the stuff that's above the ground. It's about 400 tons of concrete underneath the ground. But 100 tons of steel and expensive, relatively technically rich equipment, mm -hmm. uh, more or less. So by comparison, uh, one of our wings at a megawatt scale is about uh, two tons in the wing, one ton for the tether, and about 15 tons of ground station sort of hardware. So there's quite a lot less, again, about 20% of the mass, right. uh, quite a bit less material involved. Um, so there is a, a very big improvement in terms of material, but then also in terms of scalability, because you can make this much, much quicker, you can deploy it much quicker, and so it's easier if you're trying to enable a much broader renewable energy um, generation, then yeah. this is a neat technology that has very neat aspects for that. Yeah, wow, it sounds really, it sounds really promising. How does it feel to be on the, the cusp, pushing forward in an alternative energy field? It's, a, it's very competitive and it's also probably a little bit difficult these days, but how, do, how does that feel? Well, it feels wonderful. I think this is, uh, we're at a very unique uh, time in history. You're not necessarily unique, but it is very neat. Um, I think this is a great time to be an engineer. With such lofty thinking comes great innovation. When we come back, we're going to find out how they control it all. We're partnering with uh, four of the, the biggest uh, venture capital firms in the clean energy space, three in the U.S., one in Europe. Uh, you know, again, we think that the combination of GE investment and venture capital investment is going to allow us to increase innovation. It's going to allow us to accelerate new ideas. It puts us shoulder to shoulder with some of the smartest tech investors. And we can use the, what I would call the industrial clout of GE to bring technologies to this marketplace faster. GE announced its challenge at a San Francisco event along with its four venture capital partners. Emerald Technology Ventures, Foundation Capital, Kleiner Perkins Caulfield & Byers, and Rockport Capital Partners have all joined with GE. Ideas from companies and individuals can be entered through the ecoimagination.com website for the next 10 weeks. So check out ecoimagination.com. So we've learned the basics of how Makani Power plans to generate energy but how do they plan to control these large planes? This is Kenneth Jensen. He's one of the guys who controls the controls. What kind of controls have you put into the, the wings that are flying, going to be flying over our, over our lands? Um, so there's a few different things we have to do. Um, so when our, our wings actually, to take off, they hover. And to hover, they have to know what attitude they're in, which means pretty much which way is up. Um, so one of the ways uh, you do that is called a Kalman filter. And you pretty much take in a bunch of sensors, like accelerometers, which tell you which way gravity is pointing, magnetometers, which tell you where the magnetic field is, and rate gyros, which tell you how fast you're turning. And you combine all that information, and you can put it all together, and you can get a really good estimate of what position you're in. And then once you know that position, you can tell uh, the various uh, propellers on the wing to provide a different amount of thrust to keep the wing upright. Eventually, uh, to generate uh, electricity, we actually have to fly this thing around in a circle up in the sky. And so we transition to a different mode of flight that we call crosswind flight. Um, and here, the propellers are no longer moving the kite forward. Now it's the wind that's propelling it forward. And here, there's, uh, there's a few different control challenges. One is we want the kite to follow a specific path in the sky. And so we have algorithms that can um, pretty much predict where the kite's going to be a few seconds in the future, and then it um, applies different sig signals to the ailerons, rudder, elevator. Um, this kite actually has control surfaces like a standard airplane, and it can position those uh, control surfaces such that the kite will follow a specific path. Um, so path following is one of the big control challenges. Another one is tension control. 
Um, a lot of the, the, the cost of our kite system um, comes down to the cost of the tether and the cost of the structure that goes into making the wing strong, um, able to withstand the forces that the, the wind is applying to it. Um, and so to do that, we have to sense what load the kite's carrying and position the, the, the control surfaces such that it takes uh, the minimum load while creating the maximum amount of energy. What kind of uh, considerations do you, do you have to take in for the different stages of flight? So the launch, the, hover, the, the hovercraft stage versus the planned circular flight. Um, there's got to be a large variability in, in wind speed, gustiness, that would really affect the forces and the path of the plane. Yeah, that, that, that's absolutely true. Um, and our general strategy is actually to design the, the wing to be almost passively stable in all these flight regimes um, so that you don't need a really sophisticated computer control system to control it. Um, so we actually try to design our, all our systems such that a human pilot could fly it if they had to. What do you think, in your, in your opinion, what would be the optimal environment to fly one of these, these kites in? Um, so the, my, my personal opinion is offshore is the ideal environment for this, this sort of wind turbine. Um, not, so I guess offshore wind turbines are kind of great all around because the, the wind offshore is fantastic. Um, you don't have any issues with people uh, as having aesthetic problems with the, the wind turbines if they're far enough offshore. Mm -hmm. um, but our specific system is actually really well suited towards offshore because of the, the way the wing attaches to the platform that's holding it to the surface, um, to, to the ocean floor. So our system is really well suited to, um, it's based on a tension design rather than a, a let's see, a, a lever arm based design like a, a wind turbine is. So on a wind turbine, um, you have this, this huge tower that has the uh, blades on top of it, and the wind is applying a huge amount of force on that tower and kind of uh, torquing it over. And that's a really hard uh, motion to resist when you're out in water, especially for deep offshore situations. Yeah. And our system, uh, the wind is pulling on the, the kite, which is pulling on tether. Um, so you don't have that sort of uh, torque applied at the base. And so it's, it's much, it would be much easier to design an offshore system for this particular. You mentioned a little earlier about um, making this autonomous. Um, how, how can you get this to be reliable and autonomous and when the wind hits, or hit the, hits the right speed, the plane be able to launch itself, get up into its energy production cycle, and then if the wind speeds drop, be able um, to control without having any human intervention, or is there always going to have to be some amount of human intervention? The, the goal is definitely to have pretty much zero human intervention. And I think the best way of approaching that is just to make a very realistic model of the kite, of the wind situation, and just make sure you, you take into account all these different variables and just simulate it over and over again in a thousand different situations and make sure it always does the right thing. So simulation, make sure it does what you want in the model, then get the model out into the real world. Make and sure then it test, does. test, test, make test, sure test, test, test. Your, your real system is what's in the model. And how is everything going so far? Uh, it's actually going really well. Um, so we put a lot of our testing videos on our website uh, so you can track our progress that way. Um, but we're pretty much right on schedule to make a 20 kilowatt prototype within the, the next uh, 9, 12 months. This episode is brought to you by Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to publish a high quality website or blog. Squarespace.com has an easy to use user interface for creating and managing a website or blog. Optimized for both beginners and CSS experts makes it easy no matter your level of expertise. Hundreds of design templates to choose from and you can customize any of the designs to fit your needs. It's an all-inclusive service and it includes several modules to build your website, a blog module that can import and export your data from WordPress, Blogger, Movable Type, and TypePad. There's also a forum, a form builder where you can collect email addresses and other information from site visitors. 
Flickr photo display for choosing a thumbnail or a slideshow view, a Twitter widget so you can display tweets on your website in a customizable, great-looking format. For a free trial, go to squarespace.com. Sign up for a free account. No credit card needed. Just try it out. Build your website. Then, if you decide to purchase it, use the offer code GTT and get a 10% discount off the lifetime of your new account. That's squarespace.com and use the offer code GTT. We always want to know a little bit more about how everything works here on the Twit Network. So I'm here with Damon Vanderlind, and he is Systems Engineering Lead. Damon, what do you do here exactly? Well, I design, um, I design the wing and the tether and the propellers to match the generators and um, basically one, build one large consistent system that's all supposed to do the same thing. So I do the, the, the overall design picture. So what are you looking at now for how you're design, designing your current prototypes, what you're developing? Um, you know, what are your considerations? Uh, I would say our biggest considerations right now are, so we're going from, at the design stage, we're going from designing small-scale prototypes to prove out the concept to going to large-scale system design that might want to operate for 10 years. Um, so the biggest challenges in design at the moment are coming up with things that are going to be reliable, that don't have too many parts, that are redundant, so if one part does fail, it doesn't come down, but still does not, uh, that redundancy doesn't come at the cost of increased complexity. Right. Now, I've flown kites, I've flown remote control planes. Usually they end up in pieces, <laughs> and that might be operator error, but how over, you, you mentioned having these last for 10 years, how do you, how do you plan for that kind of, that long, kind of longevity? Uh, well, the truth is, um, whenever you're doing something new, you won't know if it's going to last for 10 years until you actually get out and fly it um, for that amount of time. But the nice thing with uh, our system is that we actually get to draw from two very large bodies of knowledge. Uh, on the one hand, we have aircraft. This thing is um, the design of the device itself is very similar to aircraft design. Mm -hmm. um, and we get to use a lot of the analysis tools and the, the tricks of the trade that have been developed over the last hundred years for that. And then it's also similar to wind turbines in many respects. Um, and so we get to use a lot of what's been learned in developing wind turbines. And so um, while it is something new and we don't necessarily, um, we can't necessarily tell if our models are going to be accurate um, until we've actually been out there and flown and seen the 50-year gust. Um, uh, we, we have a much better chance of getting the design right the first time given the existence of these two excellent uh, sources of knowledge. Do you have, you mentioned the 50-year the gust. Do you know how big that is? It's about 50 feet per second. Okay, so these, these wings, these planes are being wing, plane, kite, they're being designed to be fairly autonomous. Um, would they have it built in that, okay, underneath this certain wind speed, don't fly, don't launch, at a certain wind speed, launch, above the 50-year gust speed, stay down? Is, there, is that kind of a control just to keep the plane in one piece being implemented? Yeah, and there's definitely an optimization towards, um, you know, when you want to put the thing in the air and generate power, versus when you want to keep it down. And the nice thing that we found is that it's actually very easy to control in high winds, something that a wind turbine, so with a wind turbine, you get to control the pitch of the blade very slowly. And um, with an aircraft, um, the, if it experiences a gust, it actually, the wing, um, say a gust comes um, in the D-axis, the wing actually adjusts in, in pitch until it's at the right angle of attack. So a gust hits it, the wing pitches, and then um, the loads are back to normal levels. Okay. So by the virtue of being on this tether and not being rigidly fixed in pitch like a wind turbine, our gust loads are actually much lower. Um, and so by virtue of this and being able to fly um, instead of straight down wind really high in the sky, we get to um, operate with pretty low loads in pretty high wind conditions. So in simulation, it looks as if we can fly in 45, 50 meters per second, 100 miles an hour. That's pretty amazing. That's pretty high. That's very so, high. The question then is, you can fly that long, how long can you fly that, fly in those speeds, and will the, will it, will the durability main, be maintained? Yeah, so we see, we do, I mean, we see more fatigue in those situations, just mm -hmm. as a wind turbine or an aircraft would, but um, 
uh, the nice thing is the control still looks pretty robust. So um, high wind is a, you know, it's, it's, it's a concern and it will be a concern until we really get some very high wind conditions to fly in. But um, uh, it looks, it looks uh, like a tractable problem. What do you think is the most innovative aspect of all of this that you're designing? If you do all the engineering right, you will end up with something that will probably work. And you don't necessarily have to come up with anything incredibly clever to do that. Uh, most of the things we need already exist, and it's a matter of putting them together in an elegant way. In the words of Buckminster Fuller, there is no energy crisis. There's just a crisis of ignorance. There's power all around us. It's just our challenge to figure out how to access it. In this particular case, Makani Power is taking to the skies to find that energy in a uniquely innovative way. I'm Dr. Kiki, and that's it for Green Tech today for this week. Find me someplace new and exciting next time. That's it for this episode of Green Tech Today. Subscribe at twit.tv forward slash GTT and never miss a show. If you have a question or a comment, email us at greentechtoday at twit.tv or you can leave a voicemail at 415-GT-TODAY.